Uh, here we go. Back in bold. Another beautiful day in Bogota. I'm a big fan of this elevation. Even the city. I feel so freaking focused here. Not getting in trouble. I'm not, uh, you know, chasing tail too much. It's just, it's just Hakuna Matata. I, I like it down here in, in Bogota. Today we got a fun episode. I'm very curious about something that has been getting extremely popular, especially in the United States, with sports betting becoming uh, illegal. Everyone and their mother that's their new number one hobby. Um, I got a dude here. I can't disclose when or where I met him, but uh, it wasn't a jacuzzi. You know, don't think anything weird about that. But uh, we shot the shot back and forth, and uh, turns out he's a world traveling. I don't want to say degenerate gambler, but uh, he gambles on politics, like Eurovision, um, a bunch of interesting things that not many people know that you can you can bet on. So I just want to get into your world. Because, you know, I used to do a little gambling, and then I got uh, taken for, and I do miss that that feeling of my heart pumping, the adrenaline, and I replaced it with, you know, the traveling and then still playing sports, but uh, it's, uh, it's a great world. So, Billy from Estonia, how are you doing, buddy? Good. How are you? How's Colombia? Not bad. Uh, it's almost a month here in, in Bogota, so I'm heading to Cali next week, another month, and I'm more, I'm excited to start doing crazy stuff again because in Bogota um we discussed about it uh it's more of a focused city don't, don't you think there's not really too yeah, much I'm, going on when I when I've been in Bogota in the past I always feel that uh all my energy like the physical energy goes into my brain so uh it's very good for mental activity and uh overall focus yeah that nomad capitalist uh Andrew Henderson um he he's one of his bases I don't think he uses it as much as a base but he has a home in Bogota and he says that's like kind of his spot to be to get to the rest of South America. And he just likes the city. He said a lot of good cafes, obviously good prices, the mountain, the altitude. It's not too hot, not too cold. So far, I got a lot of good things uh, to say about Bogota. But Billy, so I thought everyone loses in gambling. The house always wins. Is that not true in, in your case or what? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, there's different approaches to gambling. Uh, I mean, if, if you get where you uh, if you take it as, as something, uh, if you see it from the lenses that uh, you can only win big and uh, and so on, then uh, I think uh, like it, it, it's all about the mindset. You have to have a right mindset to uh, to be really uh, continually uh, profitable gambler. It's yeah, all I mean, about, not many. Uh, it's, a, it's a few avoid, percentage. Avoid, like, yeah, I mean, there, there are not many many people out there who uh, can. Uh, continually uh, overperform the markets. And now how long have you been in this gambling thing? I mean, didn't you do something beforehand with like clubbing, promoting, or when, when did you get your toes wet in the, in the gambling world? And then how did you take that from, you know, you know, being a rookie gambler to actually being able to travel, travel the world with it and make, you know, decent returns? Yeah. I mean, I, I was actually, uh, initially I was in uh, concert business in music business. So, uh, it's quite similar. You analyze how uh, how are the cultural trends, how are the like human perception, what people want, what's what can be popular. So you uh, analyze it always from the marketing perspective, and uh, that gave me a good uh, framework to understand uh, the human perception. And uh, I mean, I gamble on mass events where people can vote, so the dynamics are very similar. I, I just predict what uh, people will like and uh, how they will uh, vote. Yeah, so that's what's interesting. We're not talking about poker and whatnot, even though I know you play a little poker and, and do some uh, traditional gambling, but you're you're really betting on, like you said, the Eurovision, American politics, um, a lot of different funky things. Cheers, by the way. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, why did you get into that? And I mean, where are these websites that you, you can even do this? You know, I've not heard, I know like prop bets, like how long will the national anthem go for in the Super Bowl and things like that. But, you know, and you know, the presidential election, I remember people were betting on that. But it seems like uh, this is more of a niche area. And you think uh, if you understand uh, uh, humans and psychology that you have a better chance of predicting the future is what you're saying? Well, I would say it has been a niche uh, area, but uh, things are changing now. You know, um, there's a new uh, platform out there, Polo Market. This is something usually we have always had the cap between Americans and Europeans. Uh, Europeans have their own platforms. Americans have their own platforms. Uh, you can't access American platforms when you're European and opposite, but um, uh, now this 
partly crypto based uh, website Polar Market, which even Donald Trump is uh, very often uh, posting in on his social media now. Uh, this offers access to everyone around the world. And this has a lot of very interesting markets. You know, you can bet on Taylor Swift there. You can bet on Andrew Date there. There's like very wide range of markets and um, it has much more media value. It's cooler than sexier than um, so far the trading platform can be. So I think the prediction markets are going to go very mainstream like 2024, 2025, uh, thanks to the developed user experience and and uh, added media value and added like uh, coolness aspects. So um, I recommend to check out Polo Market. And Americans have Kalshi also. I think they have quite a lot of uh, lot of interesting markets there. You can bet on anything there. OK, hold on. So uh, I've seen a lot of your focus, like American politics and Eurovision. OK, can mm -hmm. you talk about any big hits you've had and what led you to predict uh, that outcome? I personally know that the famous one uh, was Scott Adams predicting Donald Trump in 2016. Like he said it like basically right when Trump went down the elevator um, and then he's like, we're, we'll build the wall of the Mexicans or this and that. And Scott Adams like, you know, I know human psychology and he, he predicted it like right then and there and everyone laughed at him. And obviously Trump won in uh, uh, the 2016 election. Um, like, were you hitting on some of these? Like what were some big bets that you hit on that, uh, uh, that you you predicted through you know I saw this in, in society and and people are moving this way so I I decided to to throw it all on the line. Well, 2020 U.S. elections was uh, very successful for me, for example. Um, like usually, like amateur betters want a bit more like you know sexy things like Trump versus Biden and so on. But like there's more profitable opportunities when you uh, predict the whole race. You know, like the trends of the race, how the polls are gonna change, like especially in the primaries, like 2020, there was a Democratic primary, now there's Republican primary. So um, they offer a lot of trading opportunities and uh, and you can make like um, good bucks there. Like, uh, yeah, 2020, I think uh, the US election, I made like uh, around quarter of a million, uh, I think just in the election. But uh, it's decent it money like for a European too. That's decent money for a Euro. <laughs> Uh, for sure, yeah. Amer American have very uh, high salaries, so yeah, there's different perspectives. Okay, so, what'd you hit on that 2020 election? What were you hitting? Well, what I, kind of bets were you making? And why? I, 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 what I, I, were you hits seeing? I had it hits in a row. Like I, I was predicting Bloomberg trend. Bloomberg was a big outsider, but he became even a market favorite at some point. I was predicting uh, Bernie Sanders like rise and uh, becoming the front runner of the race. Uh, Pete Buttigieg succeeding. Um, but like the biggest hit was uh, betting on Joe Biden to make a comeback because after like New Hampshire and uh, Nevada and the um, Democratic primary, like people had totally forgotten him. He was like trading uh, like around almost like 4% probability to win the Democratic nomination. So he was like totally forgotten. So uh, I, I was betting all the way down um, like from, from the very low probability to uh to down when his nomination was uh seeming more probable so that was a very good value bet so is you're just betting when he's at four percent that he's going to be the um uh the elector or whatever the person that they choose yeah, is that what you did like or can you do this can, can you do like okay he's at four percent now i put in you know, a couple thousand dollars, and then I can sell that future when his numbers get up to 60% before it's even uh, solidified. Can you do that, stuff like that too? Or you're betting yeah. that he was going to be the, the main guy? Well, it, it, it works like stock market. You can always trade, you know, you can buy shares and sell shares and you don't have to go all the way. You can uh, you can just trade the market uh, and like predict how the market going to move. But uh, yeah, in the case of Joe Biden, I, I thought it's, uh, it's worth, I mean, <clears throat> He was totally forgotten and it felt he's going to have a big comeback. So uh, at these odds, it was really good value and a uh, good setting for betting. Okay. And then the Eurovision thing. I mean, that's like popular votes. Like, are you studying who the big singers are? If anyone doesn't know what Euro Eurovision is, it's like a, a yearly thing with all the European countries about like the best band, kind of like American Idol, but with the country. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember you have lived in you uh, you have lived in Europe as well, so uh, you have like some insight how the European stuff works. But um, 
yeah, every country in Europe sends their own artist, their own song every year. It's like a Super Bowl of Europe, you know, there's over 200 million viewers. Like, uh, it's, it's the biggest TV event of the year. So, um, yeah, it's like a music competition. Actually, U.S. tried to, uh, to, try to pr bring it to U.S. last year, but they didn't succeed because, like, the model didn't really work in U.S. Every, every state sent their own, like, artists and song, and, uh, but, um, but the ratings were bad, so uh, they canceled it for the upcoming season. How, how are you predicting that? I know you got a little music background, so you know decent music, but... You know, how, how are you saying, okay, fucking the, the Slovenians are going to win this one because uh, of X, Y, and Z? Well, I, I think it's very similar to U.S. elections or like film awards or like talent shows because it's all about human perception and culture trends. Like what is the safe case like thinking now? Like what is what people want right now in this particular time of, in the moment? Uh, but like Eurovision is also a lot about cross-cultural psychology and cross-cultural uh, perception. So like... As we both have traveled around the world, we study a lot about the different cultures. And it's the same in Eurovision. Like if you uh, you have to analyze every country's voting separately as well to like predict how Armenians are gonna vote or how um, Greek are gonna vote or how uh, Finnish are gonna vote. So uh, there's a lot of like cross-cultural um, psychology um, aspects there. Okay, uh, I know how we can get practical. I know how we can get practical. You said the zeitgeist? Okay, how mm -hmm. are you figuring out what where the pendulum is swinging and what way is moving? Are you on Reddit? Are you on 4chan? Are you just talking to random people while you travel? Tell me how you get into the, the zeitgeist and be able to predict the future with the, these trends. I mean, it, it, you just have to have common sense, follow what's happening in the media, social media, and have good intuition and instincts. Like, I, I think that's most of all. Okay, so what are you following on the social media? Like, what are you seeing through the, the news? Like, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, I, I see how I get some of my, like, in-tune things is you, you get some of those reels, you know, and usually those are taken from the most popular TikToks. So, obviously, you're seeing, like, okay, people are into this Stanley Cup thing, you know, but how do you mm -hmm. uh, figure it out beforehand that they hit the trend and, and make a crap ton of money out? Because most of the time, I try to stay out of all this stuff. The only reason... I look at some of it as I like to comment on it for content and the bull perceptions and, and so forth. But if I didn't do that, I mean, I would try to stay the hell from everything because it just seems, you know, very, you know, cancerous or 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 really uh, group thinking, right? But tapping into that group thinking and making money off it sounds amazing. Yeah, I mean, like the group think is actually good. Uh, following the herd is good when you're betting, betting on mass events because if you are, uh, I wrote an article about it as well, like, you got to become the part of the herd to really feel what's going to happen because like otherwise if you're too rational or too analytical uh then you can miss like what's the zeitgeist and like what's the feeling in the culture in this particular moment you know uh like emotions are your friend in the sense in in most cases so tell me where do you think the culture is at right now worldwide overall the feeling what's the zeitgeist right now where is it moving towards you're studying it, so you should have an idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually uh, wrote an article in August about, like, uh, where are we right now, like, uh, culturally, like, what is the cultural trends and zeitgeists? Uh, I mean, overall, like, I mean, the zeitgeist is always moving, so uh, you may be a step ahead if you think, like, the same trend will prevail, but, uh, like, generally... Uh, what I wrote in August, it was uh, most about what what the last year's results also proved that we are more into uh, like joyful, uh, fun escapes. Like the world has, like the global turmoil has been pretty bad. Like the COVID, the Ukraine war, now the Israel Palestine. So we want to escape to uh, more lighthearted, lighthearted fun, uh, more simple, more simplicity, authentic authenticity. Uh, like, uh, I think human mind works like seeking the balance all the time, like the contrast with uh, what's currently happening. So, uh, like considering uh, how much more tense the world has gone recently, so uh, that gives a boost to uh, more simple, more authentic, more joyful, more lighthearted stuff. 
um, like that's the spirit in entertainment, I think. But it always changes yeah. still, like because we always look back what's happened like last year, and we want to have like a contrast to that. So like we're always seeking the contrast. It's like Yin and Yang. What's trippy is um, a couple points on that. Uh, when I was in Italy before the COVID stuff hit, um, they were I found this like blog or someone told me about someone that predicts the future uh, trends for um, a fashion, right? And uh, they're usually ahead of the curve and they're saying, okay, what's coming next season, that season. And uh, it was really hidden, like the doom and gloom. Remember like Kanye's, all his like uh, muted colors and military fatigues, like all this stuff was like going into like before the COVID, the wars, and it hit like right at the right time. And now you're saying, okay, now more light and fun hotter. And it does seem like that with K-pop, that's super popular. Um, you know, more cutesy kind of things people are trying to gravitate to with all the, the, the negativity we were thrown uh, out there on the news and the social media. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, for sure at this point we are, I think, looking. There's a there's an idea about the credit card spending, like doom spending. Like people are so worried about the outside world and everything that's going on that they're just maxing out credit cards and spending. And that's why the numbers look so good during the, the Christmas and the Black Friday shopping. So everyone's like, where the hell is this money coming from? I thought we we're in a mini recession, right? Um, so that is fascinating. That's the part I struggle with, though, is like, you're right. You need to to go in with the herd and camouflage yourself to, to get ahead of trends, to make money off it. I mean, the best examples I was seeing on this Twitter, because I've been on Twitter like the, this past year, like I've gotten back onto it. And there's a lot of insightful things there. I think there's a, still a ton of negativity. But these dudes were talking about, you know, during the elections, they were making hundreds of thousands of dollars selling like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders beanie bags or, you know, Trump uh, dog toys. And then like they were they're just playing both ends, seeing what party. OK, this is these liberals. These people really like this. So I'm going to make a shit ton of money off them. But then the Trump people want this kind of stuff. And uh, it was just fascinating to like, yeah, put yourself in those groups and figure out how to leverage and take advantage of it, which I mean, a lot of people do. Yeah, I think like one good example of lighthearted trend like uh, is also the Taylor Swift right now, the, the oh, momentum she has. Like uh, she's been around for a long time, but now she's really peaking because uh, that's what we want like right now. And like she won also the time person of the year. Uh, she was actually uh, not a favorite to win it by the market, but like usually politicians or like more serious uh, stuff wins there. That was, I think, the first time ever, like, a musician won the time person of the year. And, like, I, I think it's one of the proofs uh, also, like, uh, what's happening with the zeitgeist right now. Okay. So how do we capitalize off the zeitgeist then? So I'm, I got to invest in cheerful thing. Okay. Speaking of that, I brought up that Stanley Cup. So I've been seeing all this stuff now because people are bashing on the Twitter about, like, a Stanley Metal Cup is, like, super popular in the USA right now. And the, mm -hmm. these girls, like, they have their, like, accessories and they have their snacks around it. And they're making these very aesthetic videos about a freaking, like, water bottle, you know, Stanley Cup. But it's, like, cute and and the marketing is really good, to be honest with you. Like, the UGC-type marketing. Um, but, yeah, so how do we capitalize on this? You know, what are we well, going to be like, betting on? Huh? I mean, like, right now, like, U.S. US elections is pretty, uh, pretty uh, like, current topic. So, like, I think also Donald, Donald Trump. Trump matches like good with his friend because he offers very uh, simple uh, escapes. So people wanna wanna have just a simple escapism, and uh, and it boosts also Donald Trump appeal, uh, like this kind of uh, more simple and uh, easy, easy fun, you know. I definitely think he's a comedian. You know, he's funny and whatnot. But a lot of people think he's like the you know the Hitler, right? So how yeah. is that to escapism? Maybe to I, I haven't seen the, the, the tie change. Like, he, he's a great showman. So, uh, See, like, he promises very really simple solutions, very really emotional solutions. And, like, this is more appealing when the world is more complex, you know. If the world is less complex, we, we like to think more, we like to analyze more. But, like, Trump offers very really, uh, simple, uh, simple uh, solutions and simple, um, emotionally uh, effective, like, uh, gratification okay but i mean right now the, he's leading the poll so that's not a really good bet can you give me a different uh realm of no, but his odds are still pretty good like they the are? market 
I mean, depends, yeah. Like, for example, I, I bet on uh, him winning a popular vote. The odds have been like less than 20% uh, for that. Uh, but like, yeah. Well, it, it's hard to find, like you're American, so you don't know all the like European events, but like... Um, what about the German far right party? I've been seeing that. They've been inching up the polls. That could be easy to tell with all the online angst and the, the Turkish in there. Um, that could have been an easy better. The whole Europe is moving to the right besides Poland. They they finally got rid of the PSI. Um, are you betting on these markets? Are you seeing the – yeah, tell me what you're seeing the future of, of Europe, the zeitgeist in Europe. Because after uh, Palestine, it seems like the Euros went full on, you know, uh, kick every Muslim out of the country or out of the, out of the European – Union. Well, right? I, actually, when I think about it, like we both uh, know a lot about South America as well, and like the Argentinian presidential election kind of like matched with the trend as well, because uh, the new Argentinian president uh, is also like very emotionally appealing, very uh, showman. Like, I mean, that that's that's again like similar pattern, you you know. No, but, but it's uh, the opposite for Europe, though. It's getting really yeah, serious I, I really and dark. European politics, like very, very closely. I don't usually bet bet much on European politics, so I don't have like a very, uh, very strong opinion right now on that. I will tell you what, though. Um, but it was before kind of last year. I forgot when Lula was elected, the Brazilian guy. Was it two years ago after Bolsonaro? And Lula's uh, really, yeah. twenty two really, November. Also, during after COVID, the darkness and the Ukrainian war. Okay, yeah. That makes sense because Lula's very, oh, all the college kids love Lula. He's so nice and amazing and, you know, the commie socialist. So he fits that, like, all the memes I see from Brazilians. I lived in Brazil all of last year. is like, oh, he's he, he's like my grandpa, but he's cute. And so he's kind of, he brings out that little playful joyfulness too. Um, interesting. Uh, I know Pedro in, Brazil, in Brazil, I think there was a lot of similar dynamics than in the U.S. as well because there was the anti Bolsonaro vote, you know, like there's in US it's gonna be anti Trump vote. It's just gonna be a question if uh if Biden can really like unite the vote because Biden has had a pretty bad run. So uh like he's very uh has very low uh, approval right now. How long do you see this uh zeitgeist uh being all lovely and roses and dandelions? And a point I was gonna make that reminded me of what you're talking about is like the 90s when it was perfect in the usa but then grunge and goth and emo like started exploding even though like we had this great economy no wars you know everyone was living in a fairy tale on the flip end we were the opposite with our music and our you know vibe which was that's the interesting thing about how like the opposite to, of the current events and what we want to, to see and how it uh, creates it well, I, I think like human mind and culture both work uh, in yin and yang. So like See. if there's going to be an overdose of all these like <clears throat> more lighthearted and uh, <clears throat> cheesy stuff, you know, there's there's a natural compass inside of us wants to move back to the more serious stuff to balance it out. You know, there's, we're always looking balance. I think it's like in human nature always to seek for balance. So uh I mean, it, it can happen this year. Like even in film awards, we see now that like um, like there's some backlash to the lighthearted stuff. There's uh, there's still like because we have had this trend for a while, or there's, there's some backlash in it. I will say already now. The, but like uh, let's. You were see. talking about the Oscars. You were betting on the Oscars, yeah. no? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, did that go because down? Did that re-happen? I forgot. Who won the awards? Well, Oscars are still ahead, but if we look at the Brie oh. Awards and the nominations so far, uh, so it, it feels like Oppenheimer is going to really sweep the season. So, uh, like Barbie and Boo things are the uh, like representations of the more lighthearted stuff, or uh, like what the overall sidecast has been recently. But um, I mean, it's more complex, like. Cultural trend sends like some momentum and some direction, but if you have something very good, which even doesn't match the cultural trend, fundamentally very strong, then it can still over prevail the cultural trend, you know, like because Oppenheimer is very, very loved by uh, everyone, like public, film people, critics. So uh, it feels like Oppenheimer is unbeatable for Oscars this year, for example. 
All right, what about the, the question, um, does art imitate life or does life imitate art? This kind of goes into your zeitgeist thing. What do you think? Um, that's a very interesting question. I, I have to uh, um, think about it. Um, I think it depends on some cultures, like the, the Slavic culture. I think life definitely imitates – or no, art definitely imitates their life. They make a lot of depressing music, paintings, like uh, – uh, books and, and and what kind of stuff, but I'm trying to think of different other cultures like the Asian and the, the Americas and, but um, or I, I think it goes both ways. It, it's very you know reflective. You know, reflex reflexivity is like the one of the frameworks how the world works. So like, art reflects the culture, but then the culture reflects back. It's like never ending uh, circle, like between the both uh, art and uh, life, and like they always reflect each other. And then through that symbiosis, something new, there's something new graded. Okay, kind of off topic, but the gambling, I want to get into the mindset of, of the gambler because I think I relate to a lot of it. And I think a lot of dudes, especially, do. Um, I get it through the sport I play, it gets me that dopamine, that heart, the adrenaline going. Um, I get it through some traveling, uh, dating woman. Like uh, I'm always searching for those highs. And I know a lot of people get it from the gambling. Why is that? Why do you think um, you're uh, pulled to that sweating hand feeling, you know, risk, you know, doing a lot of risk uh, feeling? Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I guess it's in my nature. Like, I mean, I, I do the gambling stuff. I don't, I don't usually do like uh, the whole year, like half of the year I gamble, half of the year I, I, I live more global life, more uh, social life. So uh, I feel, uh, as you mentioned, the dating and like the whole pickup stuff and uh, that, that's very similar to gambling. It, it gives you uh, like a lot of adrenaline and uh, it's, it's psychologically very, uh, very similar. So I, I guess it, it depends on the personality type and uh, aspects like that as well. Like, uh, I mean, men on like, I, yeah, I overall think there, it varies between people. Some people want more safe, safe space. And, uh, but uh, that's, I, I'm more like a adventurous mind, I guess. Okay. I, but I how do you deal? How do you deal with the negatives though? You know, how do you decompress? How do you not lose your freaking brain? Uh, because you, you need balance. We talk about the balance of the betting and the, the zeitgeist and everything. And uh, that's a, a, a huge thing when you're living extreme sort of lifestyles, right? And I think gambling, when you're doing professionally, you know, that's an extreme sort of lifestyle. When you're traveling nonstop, you know, nomadic, that's extreme. When you're not with a monogamous partner, that's pretty extreme too, you know, unique. Uh, how, how do you, you find that balance or, you know, are we fucked up? You know, that's another question because a lot of people living extreme sort of lives are ticking differently, right? Well, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, like for me, I, I just feel uh, you have this kind of like phases when you have to have high performance, then you're going to give everything from yourself. But like the other part, uh, you're going to just chill more, relax more. And then it and then balances out, you know, uh, like uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's a very – because my problem is, okay, when I go get the normal life, when I do a little normal life, I get, go crazy, right? And I don't think uh, – I hate to be the guy, okay, well, back in the day, you know, we were out doing wars and hunting every day and always getting our adrenaline fix, and, and now you're a 9-to-5 worker on the computer and your highs are watching your little football team that doesn't you – have, you have no effect on the football team, like – I think it comes down to purpose. I think that's all we're searching for. And I think sometimes we conflict the the adrenaline highs of the gambling, of the, the womanizing, the, the traveling, any sort of extreme lifestyle is our purpose, right? And I think there's probably healthier purposes uh, out there to get that fit. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. But I, I just, I have like inner engraving to feel alive and like this kind of stuff yeah. make me feel alive. Like, I don't know how it's for you exactly, but like... Um, I don't like too stable, too boring life, too uh, too much, too many routines. You know, like uh, I want I really want to feel alive. Okay, now can I ask you how old you are? Thirty-three. 
So what's the plan in the next five years? Are you going to settle down at all? Are you going to get bases? Are you going to keep gambling and traveling or what? Well, uh, go with the flow, you know. Let's see. Uh, like you got to feel what's like you got to go. What's the feeling right now? You, you can't predict it like long term, you know. There's different phases in life and you you may start uh, feeling differently. Like uh, I'm op very open minded. But uh, you grew up in Estonia too, right? So, I mean, I don't know if you're a small village or you're in Tallinn. Um, uh, when did this little travel bug hit and you started, you know, going around the world? Well, <clears throat> it was already earlier, but like the bigger momentum came, like I think uh, 2017 when I broke up with my ex fiance. Uh, after that, uh, yeah, I, I, I've been very, uh, very, very global, let's say overall uh not really estonian based and like my, my official base right now is in malta as well so uh, uh it's a great tax haven yeah that for sure as well <laughs> okay but, so yeah. that, that's seven years about what um what has changed in billy's brain and and uh views and perspective from being an estonia boy in the village to you know mr global citizen what kind of big realizations have you had do you think well i mean i i'm very really, uh, i like open world uh i like open-minded people i like uh, i mean i i don't want to be very really fixed you know like the more global mindset gives you uh gives you a boost in the sense of uh of freedom and um and how uh how open your mindset overall is because in in like more close communities more local communities there's like different different game you know people think very differently there they have like okay. their own small circle and uh all the thinking goes like from there what's funny to me is talking to anyone around the world they say very similar things about okay where they're from and the closed mindedness and you know how things are done over there but it's everywhere in the world the Asians say yeah, it, yeah, the Euros say it, that. Africans, and then so I go to Africa. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so open and so crazy and so different, and the whole perception is reality, and and it's fucky to me. But I'm gonna relate this back to the zeitgeist. Do you think we are going to a more free world or a more closed world? Um, do you know uh, Nicolas Nassim the the lab? No, who's that? Well, he's a he's like been one of the uh, like most influential like thinkers in the past 20 years uh he wrote the book like black swan anti-fragile skin in the game oh i heard like, anti-fragile i've heard about that one okay yeah he, he he had a really good tweet about it recently he was like comparing it to like the entropy of like how the energy entropy works like in the in the sense of physics and uh <clears throat> like there are like some overall trends in in the world which may have some uphill battles, some obstacles, uh, but like in long term, there's this entropy effect, like how the trend is moving and like what's the long term like path of this trend. And like, I think this shows pretty clearly that uh, that we are moving, yeah, into more free world. Even like right now, it, it seems differently. We have some like uh, obstacles, world is getting more uh, authoritarian in some sense uh more uh messy but like i'm mean, there's always uh some volatility in the in the way of the path but like usually the trend or truth still prevails in the end so i at least hope it's gonna be like a short phase of uh obstacles and uh the long-term trend is still continuous to the to the uh, towards more free world I don't know if I'm being a uh, cliche. I'm definitely being a uh, cliche relating to like these nomadic groups and whatnot, but with the, the, the digital currencies, the, the COVID stuff, the, the bipolar world now with the Russia, the Chinese over here, the Americans, the euros over here. Um, I, I think with the far rise or the, the far right rising so much in, in, in Europe, um, I think we're going definitely to a more closed world. I mean, I think we saw it would start with Trump where people are like okay this globalization yeah it's dope i can play playstation with someone in china but now there's no factory jobs right like we're not uh getting those benefits and i think the americans kind of were on the trending part of it and i think everyone else is is starting to get aboard with you know shutting things down being more isolationist you see the trade 
uh, the trade routes can't even work no more. They're going uh, under South America, like the 1700s. I mean, I I think we're moving into the direction of like, you know, maybe history repeats itself with the 30s of the 1900s and the nationalist movements, the commies, the, um, I, I don't know if this, this globalistic free type world is um, going to work for one, because the Westerners are starting to lose a lot of their power, right? We're not mm-hmm. as big as kings as we were and, and controlled everything and, and uh, leveraged the sweatshops over here to get cheap Christmas toys. So I'm preparing myself to be free no matter what it happens. But I think for the average person, it's, it's going a little, you know, downhill for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I actually, in, in, in most part, agree that, like, <clears throat> this might be actually the next phase. But, like, I think right now the, the right, right-wing right movement and everything is, like, quite natural, like, reflex against the... Uh, because, because the far-left movement, the woke movement, has, like, gone too far from the reality. So it's only natural there to be, like extreme backlash to it like uh it, it would be weird if like the far right movement wouldn't like emerge from that and uh, to balance it more out but uh I, I think one of the key issues here is also like how's the ai revolution gonna go how's the yeah. all the technological and uh and like scientific like uh revolutions in in in, in coming tech like go it can be like a pretty big game changer because yeah, right now what you pointed out is is is, is the reality because I mean the structure of the society and and the, everything is like changing because of how the big online mono- monopolies are like uh, getting very powerful and so on. Like I mean, I I, I can see it happening uh, very easily. What what you mentioned, yeah, overall. So. Yeah, and my thing is. Um... I, I think the far right stuff is just as worst as the totalitarian commie Chinese shit, right? Like you're, you're going to be in the same box just on the, op, the horseshoe theory, right? You know, that, that's less freedom on, on both freaking sides. And there's dudes that are pulling for, for, okay, let's go back to put the woman in the cages. And, you know, only people, I, I still believe only people that own property should vote because you have the biggest say in there, but go back to like to the constitution. I mean, and go 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 extreme lengths, right? And uh, I worry that it's going to limit freedom on both ends. So the East, you know, you have freaking commies, and then the West, you have authoritarian strongmen, you know. And uh, I worry about that, but also I definitely think uh, we're going into the new feudalistic type age with uh, instead of the land. So the king, you know, the noble, you're on his land, you're working. It's the the app, you know. I'm on your app to do my banking to do my Uber, my Airbnb, to stream this freaking podcast. Like now who owns the digital turf is the new feudal king that uh, you have to obey by. If you say bad things, obviously you get taken off. You can't use PayPal no more. Your funding is, you know, stripped. Uh, you have to rely on cash, which is slowly being taken away in a lot of countries, especially in Northern Europe. I mean, it was very hard to use a credit card and, uh, or not a credit card cash in uh, Scandinavia. Um, I think that's going to lead to the rest of uh, uh, Europe as well, USA. So I don't know. I, I got to find the answers, but I know I will be free either way. I just I don't see us getting more um, free generally as the population. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see the risks you pointed out. I mean, but like it depends how long term we are uh, talking about as well. Like, I mean, there, I, I believe you can be right about this kind of phase coming. But like, if we're talking about like more long term, then uh, I mean, there's still good signs as well. Like the empathy it has been growing through history and in the past decades as well. Like uh, it's going up more and more. Uh, the shared economy is still uh, uh, getting more natural for our like mindset like i mean they're like i think positive and negative like green and red flags uh right now so uh yeah uh it's quite hard to predict but yeah i i I think your scenario can be actually pretty plausible as well at least short term and i think whatever situation uh the society is in there is a, a benefit in one direction so right now 
uh, going to college and getting a nine to five job and doing the basic life that was successful 50 years ago in the USA is not the right path. Okay. Being a, a nomadic person who can Google translate everything, get everything done through a phone, the Airbnbs, the Ubers. I have credit cards. I don't have to do foreign cash. Um, I can make the dollar and spend the peso is life on the most easiest mode in the world. You know, like the, the whole, I eat better than the medieval Kings did. You know, I can have Chinese food right now delivered to me. I don't have to leave this apartment building to, to get uh, anything I ever freaking wanted. I can stay in a new house every day if I wanted to. So like there's pros in e each type of society, uh, but you had to figure it out like which one is the, the right route during that time period. Right. So I definitely not trying to be a doomer or anything because right now my life is freaking amazing and I wouldn't want to eat any other way. And it couldn't be this way without the globalization, without the tech, you know, without um, the openness of the, the world the past, you know, 20 years. So it's a, uh, it's an interesting thing. I'm trying to articulate, yeah. you know, actually like when I started like um, traveling more and, and so on, like 2017, I, I did it mostly uh well not mostly but one of the big reasons were was that i felt that like the area we had there was like the most perfect we had had in history and it can continue long like in, in that that much freedom sense and like that i mean there were no wars or anything and uh i mean it was totally open positive like hopeful words there weren't uh, like any um uh, real negative events happening like like in past uh four years you know so uh i, I think it, that had maybe been like the golden age like 2017 18 19 when like uh, we didn't really have any real worries about the world and everything was moving in a good direction you know and that is the crazy part because for americans 2016 to 2020 for half of the population it was hell on earth and it was the craziest time in the world even though no new world new wars got started in the usa which was like the first time in 200 years um and that's another big point that i mean this podcast is called bold perceptions is like I, I definitely think well one living bold unlocks you know the fortune and then you know perception is, is reality and it's how how you see things right and i noticed this with twitter or x getting back on that like uh, I, I get more angry and angry because the stuff that's posted on there, because that gets the most, you know, clicks and the the, the repost. And um, you know, if I wasn't on this X, I'd be like, oh, I'm in, uh, you know, Bogota. Life is amazing, Akuna Matata, and that's just a, a perception warp I'm going into, right? So um, I definitely think, uh, yeah, it, it's just crazy. One person's paradise is one man's trash, and and so forth. Like for you, you said that was the best time to start traveling. And for a lot of people, they thought it was the end of the world. You know, North Korea is going to launch a nuke in California, right? I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, my best, the best year of my life was 2020, like when the COVID happened. And like, uh, I mean, for most people, or at least many people, it was a pretty bad year. But like, yeah, we have like different stories and different. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a great year for me, bro. I got to see all of Italy, no tourists. Oh, it was La Dolce Vita. I, I was in Italy right when the pandemic started from there. In, like, it started Where? from Milan and Northern Italy, and it was right there when they started closing borders and police came to the streets. And like, uh, it was a very interesting experience. You were in Milano? Yeah, right when the COVID started. Like, you know, the global pandemic started uh, from there. Hmm. And I'm in Italy, right there. West. Yeah, right there when they started, yeah. And then they showed the trucks, the military trucks in Bergamo, like carrying all these dead bodies. And oh my God, the Italians went crazy, bro. They were, I remember there was police everywhere. I had to have a little slip to go to the grocery store. You know, luckily the person I knew was a, was a cop. So I had more freedom, but then they opened up like loopholes after like a month and they did, mm -hmm. did like a really small print, like after 10 pages saying like, uh, you could visit loved ones. Cause you know, a lot of Italians like, uh, are either in school up north and their grandparents are down south or they live in the countryside. And uh, so I figure out a way to travel by saying I was getting married, you know, like I had uh, mm -hmm. someone in Florence, uh, Tuscany, and I was in Emiliano Romagna, like, hey, say we're getting married because I'm done with this bullshit. I'm traveling. So that was uh, a way to get over the loopholes. And then it was amazing. I think in May they opened up the region so you could travel all of uh, – uh, Emiliano Romagna, there's a lot of cities I went to, the Parmas, the Rimini's, the Ferrara, but Modena. And then uh, in June, they open up only to Italians, the the country. 
-hmm. And that was something, bro. Like going to the Vatican with no line, you know, seeing no one on the Spanish steps, uh, you know, the Domo, not a, not a person there. The Eiffel Tower, or not the Eiffel Tower, the Leaning Tower, all those mm -hmm. people taking photos in there, there's no one there. It was a ghost town. So, no, I definitely agree with you. 2020 was one of my favorite years ever. It was a total freaking uh, uh, movie. But speaking of that, and we'll wrap this up, um, all your traveling you've done, let's just kind of shoot back and forth about different cultures, different places, what you like, what you've uh, uh, noticed. So um, where do you want to start? What uh, area of the world? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, I like Bali the most probably. Indonesia. Yeah, that's interesting. Tell me. You, you haven't been there, right? No. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, you should definitely go. Like Bali is... Uh, it's pretty unique there's no place like bali in the world so um that's definitely uh probably my uh number one preference or tip but like uh indonesia overall is is great as well um uh, but uh i mean i i like some countries in south america you know more about south america like argentina brazil I mean, colombia is pretty uh pretty cool as well what's uh, interesting about bali is uh, a dude that's traveled the world, like yourself, mm -hmm. that I respect his, his opinion, uh, Chris. Oh, wait, you know Chris, Chris the freelancer. Yeah, yeah. Um, he uh, That's his favorite place, too. Obviously, it's closer to Australia, so it helps him out to so go back to the home and the mm -hmm. family. But um, he's like, dude, there's no place like Bali. And I'm like, I yeah, see all he's these. He's planning to move there soon, yeah. He just uh, recently mentioned he's, he's, he's planning to settle there for a while. Yeah, but he's like all the places he's been is crazy to me. And then he, he wants to stay there and I see these reels and I see all the stuff about Bali and these hippies, new age people. But you told me, and he told me that dude, just stay away from that area and you get the local vibe. It's still amazing. Like, uh, uh, and, and that's true, huh? Yeah. I mean, in Bali, the, the one of the biggest like, uh, charms is that every neighborhood has really unique character and vibe. Like inside of Bali, there's like, so many different places like with different vibes like you know like new york la uh whatever like cities in the us for example there's like in in one small island there's like this kind of areas which have like totally different vibe you know like seminyak changu ubud uluwatu like uh they're like totally uh different for every every each of them you know and well, they dude, have a the very strong charm and character indonesia has almost as many people as freaking america usa 300 million people in that uh, country it's, it's unbelievable like that's like a place that like no one really understands how how much is going on over there i mean 300 million people is insane but i'm curious what are your thoughts about the usa and americans well uh <clears throat> honestly past, I, lead, I lead in the states as well in california uh, when i was studying some time uh, filmmaking there but uh i mean I, i've always been uh I mean, things are getting messy there recently, but I'm I'm very pro U.S. overall. Like I, I feel uh, my fundamental uh, perception of the world, how I see things, is is often more similar to Americans than Europeans. So uh, U.S. I consider like still one of my homes. You know, dive into that. What do you mean, see the world like an American compared to a European? Well, I mean, I Americans and Europeans are very really different in in many ways. I think like. Uh, like uh, in the US, it's all about the mindset, ideas, like uh, it's more abstract. People think more abstractly there. Uh, but the Europeans are more about like, where are you from? Who's your family? I mean, it's like less less free in some sense, I think, Europe, like the whole, whole mindset there. Because uh, in the US, you can create your own, uh, you, you can design and create your own identity. But in Europe, you're like more fixed and you, how you see the world, how you interpret the world events and how you interpret other cultures. Like Europeans have often their own like very national point of view, which doesn't really match with my thinking. Americans have like more, uh, more global uh, understanding of, of these things, I think. Well, hold on, you said more global understanding because the stereotype like, is I mean, the American. <clears throat> that we're all in the, in the, like in the planet Earth. And uh, I mean, oh, okay. America is not based on nation, really. It's based on ideas. It's based on vision. It's based on the mindset and the philosophy. So the whole cultural thinking is is different in a sense, I think, because uh, 
the concepts, how we interpret the words, are they different than Europeans in the world? Europeans are like very, very uh, like rational and, and like in mat material based world, I would say. Like if you charge people or, and, and so on. I think the biggest difference, okay, you said the Euros are more rational. The Americans are delusional. And as good and as bad, okay, is the reason we put a man on the moon. It's the reason Hollywood, you know, took over the freaking world. It's the reason we got a shit ton of money. Um, it's the reason we came from, you know, the the low lowlifes, the, the, the dorks of Europe and left the, the kings and queens to start something in a foreign world, the frontier. You know, then we didn't know what the hell was going to happen, right? So, like, there's that delusional tunnel vision, you know, the the world, we can do anything we want in here in, in the USA. I think that's going away a little bit, which is really sad. But on the flip end of that delusion is, uh, you know, we're freaking narcotic, you know, whatever, narcissistic, like we're fat, we don't dress good, we don't have much manners, we're not cultured at all. You know, like a Euro is, you know, and understands the Italian thing, the, the Slavics, they're, they've studied the uh, Renaissance uh, history. And so I think uh, there's pros and cons to it, right? My personal opinion, and obviously I'm biased because I, I grew up in the USA, right, is I think if you have the American mindset, you live the Euro lifestyle in a third world country is like the pinnacle of everything, right? Because you still yeah, get that American – yeah, you get that American amazingness and delusion. I can do whatever I want. You know, the Euro lifestyle is very like uh, you you enjoy life, not just working to death. You're cultured. You're uh, you know, and then the the third world is the vibe. Is the vibe? Is the cost of living? Yeah. Of course, is the woman. <laughs> but uh, that's the trifecta for me. Am I explaining that decent or no? No, I, I totally relate to that statement. I, I feel the same. Like it's good, the best to have the mix of like. Uh, European American and and the dirt for like um, pros and pros. I I, I think um, in the sense that uh, like even when I mean I've been in US, I feel still more the Europeans who live there but share the American mindset still feel more relatable to me than uh, than like local Americans often uh, or like foreigners overall. But uh, yeah, but. I agree also that America has has a real mental health crisis right now. See, sí. but like, what's the good thing about Americans or Europeans? In my opinion, is that you guys think more in abstract concepts, but Europeans are like very in the physical reality, which makes Rich, progress, yeah. innovation, growth more hard, because the abstract thinking is sí. what's what's fueling the innovation, you know. Exactly. No fucking innovation in Europe, you know, maybe uh, in the Nordics. I think the Nordic people are doing some decent stuff up there. Um, but uh, like Italy, they're so stuck yeah. in their freaking ways and their country is dying, you know. Yeah, and like Americans uh, have the mindset. That's that's the age of Europeans. You have the right mindset. Like, for example, failure is fine in U.S. In Europe, failure is not fine. And that's uh, another like uh, aspect which gives Americans edge, like in the sense of business and uh, innovation uh, growth. So, uh, I mean, I would, I would say, yeah, both every continent has its own bros, but uh, I, I think- What do you still, think the like, Asians do? Yes. What do you think the Asians do good? And what do you think they do bad? Well, too? Indonesians are pretty much my favorite people in the world. I really like Indonesian culture and Indonesian people, uh, but like yeah, Asia speak, you know, there's, uh, there's different areas, but- uh, um uh, i think they follow the rules too much they blindly follow authority way too much yeah, the that's, asians that's right uh, but they're like very collectivistic but in some situations yeah. it can be good like COVID was more avoided there in, in many countries because they safety amazing yeah safety. it's really safe most of most of asia is very safe yeah so uh i mean again there's pros and cons in every every continent and uh every culture you know I just did a, a thing because um, I've been thinking about it ever since I was in uh, Thailand was um, uh, that crime is not about poverty. That's like the main talking point for a lot of people, especially in the USA. Oh, oh yeah, I saw your Instagram post about it. Yeah. Yeah. If they weren't poor, they would be happy and everything would be safe in the USA. But then I'm like, hold on a second. I was in the dirtiest slums of freaking Cambodia. Um, 
some crazy places in Thailand. And I felt way more safe there with people making a dollar a day with no freaking toilets, no social services compared to like a major uh, uh, USA city. So how the fuck can that be possible? If poverty creates crime, you know, then why do I feel so safe in these areas, right? And because uh, they'll say, oh, Latin America is so poor. That's why they're so, you know, crime, you know, ridden and whatnot. I'm like, no, they're the same. They're, the Southeast Asians are poorer than South America. What are you talking about, right? So what do you think about that concept after you've traveled the world? Do you think uh, crime and well, That, that actually stuff? aligns with my, my mindset in betting, like that uh, culture is the key. Like I analyze my betting events also through the cultural lenses mostly. And uh, I think culture gives us a framework how we see the world and how we react to it. And and, uh, and as you said in your Instagram post as well, like culture is, uh, I mean, economy can play a role, but still culture is the, the major uh, major uh, element there, I think. And that's one of the biggest, probably, unless you're very religious, the biggest programming you have in your brain is cultural programming. That yeah. really shapes how you live life. You know, if you oh, stay you, in those you bubbles. Travel the world, you've seen how much the perception actually varies between different cultures. There's like it's unbelievable. That that the variation is very, very big, actually. Like people who live their whole life in the one country in one culture, they don't really understand how uh, how flexible is the reality. I mean, culture uh, like culture differences prove how flexible is is the human mind and reality and uh and like it's very malleable okay so but how are you studying these cultures then just because you're there and you meet some locals or how are you getting uh the gist of um you know how you're going to predict the betting markets because you understand the culture well i mean it's already in my mindset i i'm used to think about two cultural lenses so everywhere i am i just look at the people and think how they will uh how they will perceive other people or how they will vote or uh i always automatically i have a habit already to uh to see people through that lenses I guess it, 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 it makes everything feel sense it makes sense if you see these people in different cultures and you then see for example in uh your vision how they vote it all it all comes together like how the cultural perception is it's uh give me some examples people. Say it again. Give me some examples. So the Serbian culture, they're going to vote for what? Because of their culture. <clears throat> Give me some examples. Well, I mean, uh, if you go through Eurovision, like <clears throat> good examples are, for example, Albania, Malta, Estonia, Finland, like where you can really sense how the culture makes them different, how the sense or Denmark. Also, you've been living in Denmark, I think. Uh, <clears throat> like. For example, Denmark, Estonia, Albania, Malta, they have the most weird votes in your region usually because they perceive the world differently than uh, than most of other Europeans. Like they have their own common sense, very local common sense, and it doesn't really match with the uh, European sidecast often. Uh, so uh, explain it. Well, pfft. explain Denmark because I know Danish Denmark. People like very normal stuff. They don't like weird stuff. They like when everything is super normal, uh, like. Uh, and light, like very Western light, like Estonians are in sometimes similar, but not always. But Albanian, for example, uh, like screaming woman, uh, like you, you can see like how they vote, they always uh, somehow uh, lean into screaming woman, uh, what you can see in other uh, countries in Europe. Well, okay, why do you think? Because I mean, in my time in Albania, one, it was one of the safest countries I've ever been to, really nice people. Mm -hmm. They don't let you date their woman. They're very yeah, strict. I mean, with their, I mean, we it, yeah. yeah, they're um, uh, secular, Muslim, whatever they have. They're very conservative society. So why the hell would they like screaming woman? Give me some practical stuff here, not just generalizations. Well, uh, I'm not really an expert of Albanian culture. I've been there. I've seen her uh, voting in their vision, but like, I guess <clears throat> it it's probably closely related to the mindset you have seen there as well. They have like this very conservative background where men are charging women and like, they're like always like look holding an eye on women. So maybe the females are more like uh, honored there in the sense that they're like more sacred and like godless, right? Like, 
So like maybe screaming women like represent some like mythological like figure okay. to them, which is appreciated inside of the culture there. If you if you think about how they how the men control the women there and don't let them to do anywhere, then maybe they are holding them like more sacred and and so on. So uh, I guess there are like different theories and interpretations like why would it be like that? I'll tell you what about the Danes. Um, in my opinion that is probably the most advanced civilization in like recorded history and previously like the, the Swedish and the Norwegians right now. And my theory on that is that over a thousand years, you now they had the mm -hmm. ruthless Vikings, right? They have developed this society that has transcended the, the, the individual for one, the family, the surrounding community, it has gone to the whole like population. Right? There's 6 million Danes. 99.9% .9 of the country is homogeneous, the same people. And they all, like I've never seen it before, like embody, like I care for that Dane in Jutland when I live in Copenhagen. Like it's the mm -hmm. most uh, fascinating thing about like I, you, the corruption of the politicians is very minimal. The social benefits are insane. No one really complains about taxes. Um, you know, you, you get paid if you don't work, uh, the free education, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, but it's crazy to me. It's like a collective, like a true capitalist type collective. You know, not some commie shit. Yeah, but I will and, say it's really similar in all Nordics. Like the whole, yeah. like it's a risk and an even thing. Like it's like unique in the world. You can see in anywhere else in the world, but like Denmark, Sweden, Finland, like uh, all these countries, like uh, have very really, uh, clear pattern in the sense what you just told me. Uh, so individualism. Yeah, is destroyed there so like if you show wealth like you're you're laugh at you know what i mean like yeah, you know, really yeah. rich people they were very bland clothes no label showing like it's collectivism that actually works mm -hmm. which is fascinating and yes i i agree the nordic countries are like this i'm talking from my experience in, in denmark and i think it's changed in sweden i think it's you know all the the immigrants and all that shit is crazy there but um norway i've been to oslo and um uh lilyhammer very similar but um, so the Danes, I can see like, like, in a very not too controversial, you know, okay, what's kind of popular? What do we all agree upon, you know, type of person for Eurovision is what I was relating it back to. Yeah, I mean, I, like if you talk about the Nordics oral, I would say Finnish people, if you look at their voting, Finnish people are always seeking the truth. Like what is the objective truth? They want to always see like everything through objective lenses. So uh if you want to predict your vision results and finish are usually a good indicator because they're like truth seekers and swedish usually have uh, like more very western very american more cheesy tastes it's like very metrosexual culture so i mean yeah. the nordics have still like some differences which you can see in your vision like how they perceive the world and uh how they uh how they uh like interpret the reality differently you know but they're still very similar yeah. Tell me, last thing, what do you think the future is of Europe? I, I haven't really uh, thought much about it recently, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I guess Europe has been getting more messy. It's, it's, it's not the safest place anywhere uh, where to like build a future because uh, there are threats there, what can happen and... Uh, yeah, I, I don't have like a very strong vision. I I think um, the West, Western Europe, mm -hmm. is either gonna become a museum like Venice, or it's gonna be Islamicified um, with all the Islamic uh, culture in there. I think the East will last a little longer, um, but uh, yeah, I, I I don't Europe think Europe doesn't feel like a future, you know, because it's like a historical place where to travel beautiful place but uh they don't have the innovation and growth you have in the us but it, you don't have the population growth you have in in asia or uh yeah. or africa or south america so like uh yeah the future doesn't look like very bright right now i think in long term yeah i don't know but it, it's a bit, there's so many beautiful cities in europe it's it's uh it's a beautiful place and that's the issue that's the issue i talked about this recently I really think the new world worlders, the Americas mm -hmm. people, care more about Europe than the Europeans do. I think the Europeans yeah, are like, yeah, take over. 
and the the Americans, America, you know, all the Americans are like, no, you know, this is like our our ancestors. This is our culture. Keep it, you know, good. You no, know, Western Western like Western cultures overall, like in Europe and the U.S., like have become a little bit too naive, I guess, like too optimistic yeah. about like this developments and. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that it can go wrong pretty badly. Like there's a clear, clear uh, danger in that. So wouldn't be surprising if, but I mean, the US have also like right now a lot of red flags, which can like See. make the civil civilization collapse there. So I guess the Western civilization is in, uh, in draft overall. See. Okay, Billy, awesome, uh, amazing. I'm gonna let you get back to your crazy lifestyle. But uh, first just, and I don't promote gambling at all, but if someone wants to get into prop bets and learning about all this kind of shit, obviously they go check out your website, you're writing articles, but what, what other information can someone consume to, to get uh, more knowledge on this subject? Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you got to just start betting and then you learn from experience and like follow some good, uh, Good betters on Twitter and uh, just so Twitter? Yeah, I, I have Twitter. Yeah, like uh, you're I, saying, I go follow lots. betters on Twitter. I mean, yeah, like like that's how I started learning, like following forum posts and like Twitter accounts, and like that's how you get into the world and and uh, understand more what's happening and what are the thinking patterns in the in the minds of the betters. So. Uh, that's what I find so fascinating about this subject is the psychology behind the gambling and, and prediction. So, uh, but I know you do consultation and so far, you know, I met you, I think you're a good dude. You know, I don't, I don't think I trust many gamblers, so I don't know if I'm going to say, Hey, go, go to Billy and, and give him all your money. But, uh, you, you do this kind of stuff. You teach people too, no? Well, it depends on the context, let's say I, I'm because I'm mostly still focused on, on trading on the markets myself. So, uh, uh yeah uh i mean yeah i, I can i i i'm i'm open to uh advising as well but uh, i think every everyone still has to find their own path you know uh in this realm see it's built for certain people you know not everyone but uh awesome yeah you, Hi, have, Billy. To, you have to have like certain psychological profile like everybody everybody uh shouldn't do that for sure Fantastic. Hey, I appreciate you coming on. Enjoy wherever you're at uh, in the world and hope to catch you uh, somewhere. Yeah, sure, bro. It was a uh, fun conversation. All right, guys. Everyone else, live bold.